Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Sylvia. It was great to see many of you at our uh, third annual Pancake Breakfast Easter Egg Hunt uh, yesterday, and um, we had a, a great setup in the parking lot with uh, bounce houses and face painter and balloon artist and petting zoo, and uh, I think we had about maybe 200 people who were there, many families from uh, our church, many families from the preschool, which meets on our campus. And I want to just say thank you to those of you who um, showed up early to set up, those of you who stayed after to tear down, those of you who helped uh, to serve and host and uh, make it a welcoming experience for all the families who were there. And I want to give a special shout out to Chandler Hopper, who uh, did so much great work uh, planning and preparing for what was uh, really an awesome uh, family event yesterday. Uh, I don't know if any of you were among the folks last Saturday who braved the crowds in Lower Greenville for the St. Patrick's Day uh, parade. Uh, it was raining. Any, anybody there at that parade? You don't have to uh, raise your hand, but um, here's, here's my wager. Uh, my wager to you, you know, last, last Sunday I talked a little bit about St. Patrick and how um, he had been enslaved as a teenager, taken to Ireland, and uh, how after he had escaped, he later felt called to go back to the Irish to share the gospel with them, led to the conversion and transformation of, of so many people in Ireland. And my wager is probably most of the people who were at the St. Patrick's Day parade, they probably didn't know a lot about the story of the man that they were ostensibly there to celebrate. They probably didn't know uh, a lot about St. Patrick and his love for Jesus and his mission. And I would imagine sometimes that can happen too uh, on these kinds of church holidays. Today, as you've heard already, today is, is Palm Sunday. It's a significant day in uh, the history of the church. And yet, uh, maybe for some of you, you show up and you're given a palm branch and you think this is strange. And um, then later, you're kind of prompted to wave it around during one of the songs and uh, to say, Hosanna, what exactly does that mean anyway? And um, there, there may be some sense where you don't get fully the why behind the day that we're celebrating. So let me um, start there and just share a little bit more of the background uh, to this day in Christian history. So um, first century Israel, uh, the Jewish people, um, had been living really for, for centuries. There's a little gap where this wasn't the case, but for centuries they had been oppressed. They had been ruled by foreign kingdoms. And at this point in history, as Ryan mentioned, they were ruled by the Romans, who were particularly violent, who were particularly oppressive. They were taxing the Jewish people at exorbitant rates. And so the Jewish people, they longed to be free. They longed for independence from their overlords so they could fulfill their mission as God's people again. And that longing for freedom was very specific. There was a very specific longing attached to that desire. Namely, they longed for the return of the king. They longed for the return of King David. 900 years prior, David had been Israel's greatest king. Things were great under the reign of King David. There was peace, there was prosperity, there was security. The people were thriving in their relationship with God. And so the Israelites in the first century, they longed for the return of King David. Not literally King David, they didn't believe in reincarnation, but they longed for a descendant of David. And all throughout the Jewish scriptures, the prophets had spoken of a day when a descendant of David would once again sit upon David's throne and would rule over the people of Israel. And so there was this longing for the return of the king. And then along with that, you need to understand that whenever a new king was crowned, whenever a new king was, was coronated in those days, they would ride into a city. They would ride in through a parade for that coronation. So you have to imagine then as Jesus and his disciples who followed him now for three years are making their way up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast and Jesus suddenly stops and says, you know what, guys, these last two miles, I'm not going to walk into the city of Jerusalem. Instead, I'm going to ride into Jerusalem. 
You have to imagine the, 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 the sudden excitement that must have just been brimming among Jesus' disciples, the grins that started spreading across their faces, the knowing glances that they're shooting to each other as they're starting to think, guys, this is it. It's finally time. Jesus, who's been kind of strangely um, discreet, who hasn't really been um, super forward uh, about his identity as the Messiah, who's been somewhat kind of guarded about that, now is the moment when he is going to reveal himself for who he truly is. Now he's going to publicly declare that he is the long-awaited king in the line of David. He's going to announce himself as the Messiah. Now the revolution can begin. Because if Jesus gets up and rides through the city of Jerusalem, people are going to flock to him. They're going to line up to fight with him and to follow him. Notice it says in verse 37, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices. Why? For all the miracles they had seen. They know Jesus has tremendous power. They've seen him raise Lazarus just days before from the dead. They've seen him calm a storm. They've seen him heal the sick and give sight to the blind. They know Jesus has tremendous power. They also know that he's an amazing teacher, that when he speaks, people hang on his every word. He teaches with authority. They know his character, the force of his character, the consistency of his character. So they know if Jesus declares himself to be the long-awaited messianic king. He's going to have a flock of people coming to him, ready to sign up, ready to fight for him, even to die for him in order to bring about the independence of Israel. The disciples, they had to be so excited in this moment when Jesus says, I'm not going to walk into Jerusalem this time. I'm going to ride it. But they also had to be surprised. They had to be a little confused by the mode of transportation that Jesus requests to ride into the city, the instructions that he gives to his disciples. He says in verse 30, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Now, it's not as evident in this translation, but we know from the other synoptics, this is a, um, a little colt, this is a little a donkey uh, that Jesus is asking to, to ride in on into the city. And the disciples, they, they had to be thinking, you know, wh- why not a, a, a war horse? Not a, a, a Roman chariot, maybe to be led by multiple horses to come into the city. Jesus asks to ride into the city on a little donkey. Now, this last week, I was reading a kid's book to my son, Patton. It's called... Um, the donkey who carried a king. The donkey who carried a king. And I was, I was struck, one of the things it says in the book is that these, these donkeys, especially a, a donkey that's never been ridden, a little donkey, they would have been about three feet high. That's about as, as tall as my son Patton, three feet high. And, and, and you can sort of imagine then, if, if a grown adult is riding in on this three-foot donkey, have you ever seen a, a grown-up riding a little kid's bike? And, you know, they've got their kind of knees, like, pulled up into their chest. They can barely fit with the handlebars. I think that's a little bit of the image that Jesus would have cast riding in on this little donkey. And the disciples, they've got to be thinking to themselves, I mean, come on, Jesus, this is your public debut. This is your moment when you're going to reveal yourself to the crowds. I mean, this is a little bit embarrassing. We've got a little bit of money. Maybe we could hire a PR consultant for you. <laughs> or if you have one, maybe we should fire him. I mean, come on, let's, let's get you on a better mode of transportation. Why do you want to ride in on this little three-foot donkey? And yet, typically, with, with Jesus, he's, he's very intentional about the decisions that he makes. And this is a very intentional choice that Jesus wants to ride in to make his public announcement as the Messiah, but he wants to do so on a three-foot donkey. And the reason why is because, again, here we see the gentleness, we see the humility of Jesus on full display. 
Uh, We've been in a teaching series, if you've been uh, with us for the last several weeks, a series called Blessed Are the Gentle. And that's a title that comes from some words that Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 5. Jesus said, blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. And, you know, in that verse, which our title comes from, the word that's translated as gentle, it's a Greek word, it is actually only used in three other places in the New Testament. It's used in the passage we looked at a few weeks ago when Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, why? For I am gentle and lowly in heart. We talked about how Jesus' heart, the animating center of who he is, what moves and motivates him in his posture towards people is gentleness. And then again, in Matthew's gospel, when he's describing this Palm Sunday scene, Here's how he describes it. He says, Jesus riding in on the donkey was to fulfill the words spoken by the prophet Zechariah. Behold, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. And there actually was this one strand in the Jewish prophets that expected that the Messiah would come in gentleness that he would come in humility. Most people overlooked that. Jesus clearly did not. And Jesus chooses to ride into Jerusalem, but to do so on a three-foot little donkey. Because, again, he is putting on display his gentleness, his humility. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to ask, what, what do we learn about the gentleness of Jesus from this Palm Sunday scene? And I want to draw out three things that we learn. First, uh, we see that Jesus' brand of gentleness, what we mean by Jesus' gentleness, Jesus' gentleness is not insecurity. Secondly, his gentleness is not opposed to confrontation. And then thirdly, his gentleness is full of compassion. So let's walk through these three together. So first... Jesus' gentleness is not insecurity. You know, I've, I've officiated several weddings over the years, but there's only been one time that I was asked to officiate a wedding for a bride who did not want to walk down the aisle. She was willing to stand up front. She was willing to take her vows to her spouse, but she did not want to walk down the aisle. It was mortifying for her to imagine all of those people looking at her. To be the focus, to be the center of all of that attention made her feel very uncomfortable. And as I learned, the reason for that is this this bride, um, she, she didn't feel very good about herself. She didn't think she was very beautiful or attractive. She had some some insecurity, some low self-esteem about being the center of attention in that way. She didn't want to walk down the aisle because of that. And, you know, part of the work of the premarital counseling then was was helping her and helping her husband-to-be, helping both of them to understand the gospel, helping them to become more secure in God's lavish and costly love for them in Jesus, helping her to be more secure in God's love for her, as well as helping her become more secure in her future husband's love for her. And eventually she was willing uh, to walk down the aisle on that wedding day. Uh, But I I point this out because I think that that sometimes it's possible for for what um, looks like gentleness, for what appears to be gentleness, um, not to actually be Jesus' type of gentleness. Uh, in, in other words, that, that sometimes what looks like humility or, or gentleness may not actually be the, the Christian virtue of gentleness. It may not be the, the supernaturally wrought fruit of the spirit of gentleness. It might actually just be an expression of insecurity or an expression of of low self-esteem. You know, sometimes people who never want to step on anybody else's toes, 
people who are very conflict avoidant, people who never want any focus, any attention to be on them. Uh, People who are willing sometimes to let other people take advantage of them and to abuse them, who won't stand up for themselves. Sometimes what, what maybe looks like gentleness or looks like humility can actually just be an expression of insecurity. They don't, they don't feel very good about themselves. Now, on the, on the flip side, ironically, sometimes what looks like anything but gentleness People who can be very harsh, people who are prone to to belittle and berate other people when they make mistakes, those who who maybe are constantly saying, hey, look at me, look at me, I need attention, I need honor, I need respect. Sometimes that lack of gentleness can also be an expression of insecurity. Somebody who also doesn't feel very good about themselves, who doesn't really know who they are. But I want us to notice here that that Jesus' gentleness... Jesus' humility, Jesus' willingness to ride into the city, but to do so on this little three-foot donkey is not because Jesus is insecure. It's not because Jesus is, is, is uncomfortable with who he is in his role as the Messiah. He's somehow kind of trying to hide from that. It's not because Jesus doesn't know who he is. Actually, Jesus is very secure in who he is. He knows he's the king. That's why he's willing to ride into the city at all in in the first place. It's why as the crowds are taking their, their, their cloaks and they're laying them down on the ground as you would do for a king. As they're waving palm branches as you would do for a king. As they're shouting, blessed is the king. Jesus doesn't stop them. He welcomes it. He receives it. Jesus is very secure in who he is as the king. In fact, I would suggest part of the reason why Jesus is able to be so humble and so gentle, why he's not always having to say, look at me, look how great I am, or hiding from attention is because he is so secure in who he is. He knows he's the king. And I would suggest for us, friends, that the same dynamic is often true in our lives too, that if you want to grow in this virtue of Christian gentleness, that that often that will happen. We will become more gentle people to the degree, to the extent that we become really secure in who we are. We know our identity. We know who we are in Jesus. We are secure in the reality of God's love for us. We know that we are beloved sons or daughters of the king, that we've been adopted into God's family, that regardless of your physical appearance, regardless of how much money you have, regardless of your job title, your your success, where you're from, to the degree to which we know, look, I am a beloved child of the living God. You know who you are. You are secure in God's love for you. That humility, that gentleness begins to grow. That on the one hand, unlike this bride, you you don't have to be so self-preoccupied, so worried about what do other people think of me? How are they viewing me? How are they perceiving me? Are they looking down on me? Nor on the other hand, do you have to be always saying, hey, look at me, look how great I am, or attacking other people as a way to make yourself feel better to the degree to which you are secure in God's love for you. You know who you are. You're a beloved child of God. This virtue of gentleness and humility begins to really grow in our hearts and our lives as well. Jesus' gentleness, his humility here, is not insecurity. And I think because that's true, secondly, Jesus' gentleness is also not opposed to confrontation. You know, some people are kind of by temperament or disposition just kind of nicer people. You know, you're more diplomatic, you're more gentle, you're, you're able to easily get along with other people. And, and, and sometimes that comes from a, a deep desire to be liked and a great fear of not being liked. And so sometimes gentleness 
If, if it's coming from that fear of, of not being liked, um, it's, it's, it's really kind of a, a way to uh, avoid conflict. You're going to avoid conflict because you want to be liked. But because Jesus' gentleness is not just sort of temperament or personality, because it comes from the fact that he's secure in who he is, his gentleness, like our gentleness should be, is not opposed to confrontation. Look, look at the way that he confronts the, the look, look at the way that the Pharisees in this scene. So the Pharisees, they see what's happening. They see the crowds flocking to Jesus, cheering for Jesus, praising him as the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. And the Pharisees say to Jesus, they say, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Get them in line. This, this is foolishness. This is, this is ridiculous. You, you need to stop this madness that's happening here. Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Now, how does Jesus respond to them? Well, on the one hand, he responds gently. Now, Jesus doesn't seem to get offended. He doesn't react out of anger or outrage that they would challenge him in this way. He doesn't start calling down curses from heaven upon them. He doesn't, you know, sick the mob on them to, to lynch them. Jesus is gentle in his response to them. But, but also notice that on the other hand, Jesus doesn't shy away from confrontation here. He's very direct. He's very clear. He doesn't say, oh, I'm so, so, so sorry. I'll try to get them to keep the noise down. Or he doesn't say to them, listen, I, I'm just a, a lowly, humble, good teacher. I don't know where they got this idea that I'm the king or the Messiah. They must be confused. Or he doesn't say, hey, maybe this is what they think about who I am, and this is what maybe I think, but I know you have a different view, and all can be true because all truth is, is really relative, and everybody has their own perspective. No. What does Jesus say? He, he confronts them. He's very direct. He's very clear about his identity. He says to these Pharisees, he says, listen, listen, if these people keep quiet, the stones themselves will cry out. And what is he saying there? He's saying that if, if these people don't praise me and acknowledge me for who I am, that creation itself will praise me and acknowledge me for who I am. Why? Because what Jesus is doing here is he's, he's actually claiming that not only is he the king in the line of David, the long-awaited Messiah, he's not just the king of Israel. Jesus is saying, look, I am the king of creation because he's the one who made creation. He is God in human flesh. And that's the wild thing about Jesus. If you read through the Gospels, it's always so sort of um, surprising the way that these two qualities are brought together that on the one hand, Jesus is so humble. He's so gentle. He's so accessible, he's so approachable, he's so kind and tender, but he also is so clear and confident and outrageous in the claims that he makes about who he is, that he claims to be God in human flesh, he claims to be the judge before whom every person who lives will one day give an account, he claims to have the authority to forgive sins, he claims to be God. And in a way, I think what Jesus is doing in this confrontation with the Pharisees is he's, he's doing it gently, but he's, he's kind of forcing the Pharisees into a corner. He's kind of backing them into a corner. He's kind of forcing them to, to really come to terms with his identity, who he really is. That is, if these Pharisees had ever hoped that Jesus was just going to have his 15 minutes of fame, and then he was just going to kind of fade off into oblivion. Jesus here is saying, that's not the case. I'm the king. I'm the king of creation. If they don't praise me, the stones themselves will cry out. He's forcing them to make a decision about who he is, essentially saying, look, you can either receive me as the king. You can bow before me. You can crown me as your king. Or you can oppose me. You can resist me, you can reject me, you can rebel against me, you can ultimately seek to kill me. And that's exactly what the Pharisees will 
ultimately do. But what Jesus is doing is he's kind of backing them into a corner here. He's saying, look, this is who I am. And so therefore, you, you've got to respond to my identity. Jesus is gentle, but in his gentleness, it's not opposed to confrontation. He confronts the Pharisees with who he is, and he confronts us still today with who he is. Some of you have experienced that gentle confrontation of Jesus at work in your life. Maybe you look back on your childhood. Maybe you grew up within the church. Maybe you had some familiarity with Jesus and Christianity, and, and yet, as someone in our community group recently shared, maybe for, for much of your early life, you didn't really make decisions thinking about Jesus. You weren't asking, like, how do I make this decision in a way that's going to please Jesus? You weren't really thinking about him. He wasn't that important to you or to your life. You weren't centering your life around him, building your life around Jesus. And yet at some point, that began to change. At some point, you were confronted with Jesus' identity, with the fact that if he, if he really is the son of God in human flesh, well, then I can't just treat him like an add-on to my life. I, I can't just treat him like a nice consultant or advisor. Yeah, I think I'll listen to a few of the things you say, Jesus, but then I'll disregard the others. No, if he really is God then the only appropriate response is for me to give my whole life to him, to center my life around him, to fully surrender to him. You know, that's the argument that C.S. Lewis once made in Mere Christianity when he said, look, Jesus is either Lord, he's liar, or lunatic. You've probably heard this before. Either he's deceiving people, he's lying, he's not really God, And yet that doesn't seem to square with his incredibly good and loving character. He's crazy. He's a lunatic. He thinks he's God, but he's not. But that doesn't really seem to square with the insight and and wisdom of his teaching. Or he really is Lord. He really is king. He really is who he claims to be, God in human flesh, in which case the only appropriate response is to crown him as your king or like the Pharisees to reject him and seek to kill him. But, but C.S. Lewis says, look, you, you can't do the intellectually inconsistent act of just saying Jesus was one good religious teacher among many. He doesn't leave you that option. He, he, he confronts us with his identity, though he does so gently. And, and yet, and yet, maybe some of you here today, you, you, you have surrendered to Jesus before, but, but there's still that hesitation. There are certain areas of your life, even this morning, where you know you're not surrendered to Jesus. Parts of your life you know you haven't given over to him, and you're, you're hesitant to do so. Or, or maybe some of you are here this morning, and you've never surrendered to Jesus. You've never said, Jesus, you are king over my life. And and if you're in either of those places, then then, then let me say this as well, that not only is Jesus gentle in the way he confronts us with his identity, but that the way that he rules over our life is gentle as well. Think about the donkey with me for a moment. Let's think about the donkey's perspective. You know, I had a I had a professor in seminary, his name was Sinclair Ferguson. He said, if ever in a sermon you start talking about things from the animal's perspective, like that's how you know you're out of material. You got to <laughs> study more. You, you need some help. But um, I'm serious. I think here there's, there's something to be learned from the donkey. So here's this, this donkey, and this donkey has never been ridden before. Now, why does that matter? I mean, think about this. I haven't spent a lot of time with animals, but those of you who have or you've seen movies, you know, like horses or or donkeys, right? They've never been ridden before. If somebody just jumps on them and tries to ride them, what's going to happen? They're going to throw them. They're going to buck them, right? It takes time for the animal to be trained, to learn, to trust having a rider on its back. And yet amazingly, here is this donkey. He's never been ridden before. He's being ridden through these screaming, massive crowds of people. And he's willingly being ridden by Jesus. Why? 
But one commentator, I love this, his name's D.A. Carson. He wrote a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. He, he puts it this way. He says, in the midst of all of this, an unbroken young animal remains totally calm under the hands of the Messiah who controls nature and who stills the storm. This even points to the peace of the consummated kingdom. Jesus is the Lord of all, and under his hand, nothing but harmony and peace comes about. The animal knows and loves his true master for who he is. This is a foreshadowing of the healing and completion of all nature as found in Isaiah 11, the wolf shall live with the lamb. You see what he's saying? He's saying this donkey is so calm, he's at peace because he's being ridden by the gentle master, the gentle king of creation, Jesus. And, and, and listen, friends, as the donkey flourishes under Jesus as its rider, so too is it true in your life and mine. That when you give yourself to Jesus, when you surrender to Jesus, when you say you get to be king, you get to reign over every part of my life, that only leads to your good. It only leads to your flourishing. As hard as it is to trust somebody other than ourselves to run our lives, every time that you give yourself more to Jesus, he's going to lead you towards your good. You can trust him. Why? Well, because he's your king. He created you. He knows how you were made to flourish. And what's more, as we know and will celebrate this week, Jesus is the only king who would ever be willing to trade his crown for a cross out of his love for you. That's a king that you can trust, that when you let him sit in the saddle of your life, he's not going to use that power to oppress you, only to bless you. The gentleness of his so Jesus' gentleness, it's, it's not insecurity, and it's not opposed to confrontation. And yet, finally, notice with me, his gentleness is full of compassion. That's really the strongest note, I think, that we see in this, this scene. Jesus is coming into the city of Jerusalem. As he looks out over the city, as he looks out over its people, Jesus knows, as Ryan said in confession, that that the very people who today are cheering for him on Palm Sunday, these are the very people who just days later would be cheering for his execution. Jesus knows that they're going to turn upon him. He knows that the religious leaders and that the crowds are going to call for his crucifixion. He knows that these are the people who are going to mock him. They're going to sneer at him. They're going to jeer towards him as he dies a slow and shameful death. Jesus knows all of that. And yet instead of responding with vindictiveness, with anger, with scolding, with contempt, what does Jesus do when he looks out at the people of the city? He weeps. He weeps over them. His heart is full of such compassion. There are only two places in the Gospels where Jesus weeps. One, when his good friend Lazarus dies. And the other, when he looks out at the city of Jerusalem, he weeps over these people. Beginning in verse 41, we read, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now, friends, don't miss here, even as we're speaking of the gentleness of Jesus, don't miss that Jesus here is very clear about the spiritual condition of the people in Jerusalem. He says they are spiritually blinded to see him for who he is. They are blind to the spiritual reality that would bring them peace. Peace with God, peace within themselves, peace with each other. He says they are spiritually blind. And what's more, Jesus is very clear about the judgment that is going to come upon the city of Jerusalem and its people be this, this intense judgment. And he was right. 40 years later, the Roman general Titus 
would come and he would lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. He would tear it to the ground. Jesus says this historical judgment is coming and Jesus specifically links that judgment to, to, to a divine causality. He says that this was cause, this is because you missed the hour of God's coming to you. So Jesus is very clear. Don't, don't miss this. Jesus' gentleness still takes sin against God very seriously. And Jesus' gentleness speaks, it warns of that coming judgment for all of those who refuse to come to Jesus. And yet even as Jesus speaks of this coming judgment, there's no joy. There's no delight. Jesus is not scolding. There's no vindictiveness. There's no contempt in his words or in his heart. There is only sadness and longing and loss as he weeps over those who would reject him. Jesus is very clear about the costliness of rejecting him. And yet his heart is only full of compassion towards these who are far from him. And I think that the question for us then, is that, is that true of our hearts? And I'm speaking particularly to those of us in this room who would, who would call ourselves Christians. You call yourself a follower of Jesus as we look out towards those who are not Christians. Maybe those who don't know Jesus, those who are indifferent to Jesus, those who maybe would even reject or outright ridicule Jesus, what is our heart towards them? Is it judgment? Is it vindictiveness? Is it contempt? Is there part of us that, that even wants people to kind of get the judgment that's coming to them? Or are our hearts filled with compassion, with that sadness, with that longing that those who are spiritually lost would come to know Jesus as well. You know, we sang that lyric earlier in that song, Hosanna. I love the lyric. It says, God, would you break my heart with what breaks yours? It's always a good question to ask, God, do I weep over the same things that you weep over? Do I just weep over my own problems, the frustrating circumstances and things in my life, or do I weep over the problems of other people? Maybe people who don't have any food, or even worse, people who don't have any God. Are our hearts filled with that compassion for those who are spiritually lost? Do we see those who are lost with that compassion? Do we look at the lost in that way, and do we look at Jesus in that way? And see that that is his heart towards us. You know, as Ryan talked about in the confession, all of the ways... That we, like the people of Jerusalem, we turn upon Jesus. Sometimes we see him as our enemy when he's not giving us the things we think we need or want. All of the ways that we're hesitant to surrender to him, that we know he's our rightful king, that he's only going to rule for our good. Do we see that Jesus' heart towards us is not one of vindictiveness or justifiable offense or outrage? that he advances towards us only in his gentleness and his compassion in his grace, that he does not save us because of our faithfulness or our goodness, but he saves us because of his mercy, his gentleness, and his compassion. And so let's remember that together as we come to the Lord's table this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you as we come to this table this morning that you do not desire for any to be lost, for any to face the just judgment of your divine justice, but that you, you long that, that all would repent and would come to you for the grace and the compassion that you so willingly extend to us. We thank you, Jesus, that you wept over us when we were far from you. 
thank you for the way that for many of us, we've experienced how you have gently confronted us with your identity. How we've come to be able to believe that not only are you our savior, but you are our king, and to say, Lord, we want you to be the leader of our lives. And Lord, I pray that for those of us who have taken that step of surrender, that as we come to this table this morning, it would be a chance again to say, Jesus, would you lead me? Would you be on the saddle of my life? Help me to to trust you as I see your gentleness and your love and your grace towards me. And God, for any in this room who've just been, been hesitant to take that step of trusting you to be their Savior and their Lord, I pray that as they, as they see your gentleness towards them, that they might be willing uh, to do so and to find that there is great freedom, there is great forgiveness, there is great flourishing in the hands of the King. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed after giving thanks to God, as he was gathered with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body 